Bon après-midi tout le monde. Good afternoon. Uh, the difficulty when you come at the end of the day is that a lot of has been said, and obviously I'll probably repeat a few things, but at least it shows that uh, there might be some consensus about uh, how to go about uh, uh, preserving uh, the material we're uh, looking at uh, today. Just a few words about the Cinematheque quickly, uh, just to make a few things clear. The Cinematheque Québécoise is a private non-profit organization. organization. It's not a state-owned uh, institution. I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, given the fact that uh, in terms of funding, uh, we pass uh, uh, let's say, way down the list of uh, um, uh, after the national museums and all the national archives and uh, all these other organizations uh, that the Quebec government um, uh, funds and has created. So the Cinematic Québécoise <coughs> is uh, in the Quebec cinema law recognized that the, as the cinema... It says that the expression is cinematique reconnu, recognized mm -hmm. cin cinematic, uh, but it uh, doesn't mean that it comes with a pile of money. <laughs> <laughs> this has to be said because what we're talking about costs a lot of money. Memory loss. Uh, I'm, I'm referring here not so much uh, uh, about, uh, to the loss of material, obviously we lose a lot of material. We already uh, do, we will in the future. We have in the past, uh, we lost uh, most, uh, we estimate that more than 50% of the silent cinema era is lost. We've lost most of the, of the first 10 years of television in Canada. So uh, loss is part of, um, life, I would say. <laughs> but the loss, I'm, the memory loss I refer to here is in part the loss of knowledge that we try to accumulate about what we're talking today. Uh, I think as we have seen uh, d during the day, there's a lot of people uh, working on these questions. Uh, we are all dispersed in different uh, places in the world. And sometimes for uh, new people coming in or for producers who've uh, been uh, uh, producing works for the last, say, 10 years, at some point they, they start to question, uh, how do I preserve my, my stuff? And it's not that the how uh, the is unknown. As we've seen today, there's a certain number of uh, approaches possible and techniques. But uh, sometimes th that knowledge is very widely, uh, widely uh, spread out. And so, in a way, uh, there's a sort of loss there. So every uh, 10 years, uh, there's a new cohort of people that start again to ask themselves the same old question uh, that some of us have been working on for more than 25 years. Uh, today I'll go over a few uh, projects I was involved with in the last 15, 20 years. Um, I'll go a bit deeper in uh, this um, rest restoration project we did, we did uh, with the Guggenheim Museum. Um, I say restoration, although that's not probably the right term. I'll say a few words about uh, the Docam uh, project that uh, Christian Paul mentioned briefly uh, in her talk. And uh, then I'll finish with a few words about the cinematic uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, digital preservation and um, the legal deposit of film in Quebec, film and television. Just as an example of what I was uh, talking about, the, this memory loss, these are the links that the CAM, the CAM website uh, uh, put together of uh, similar research projects. And this list must have been put together prior to 
2010 when, uh, when, the pro when the camp finished. And basically, I'd say close to half of these links uh, would lead to uh, uh, nowhere. So variable media network still works, and I'm going to uh, talk a little more about that uh, in a moment. Some others still work, but uh, a few, uh, and as I say, close to half of them would lead nowhere. So the Arking project uh, was part of the Variable Media Network, and uh, it's a project that uh, I was involved with uh, uh, in the early 2000s. At the time, I was the director of the Daniel Langlois Foundation, and one of the uh, main trusts of the D Daniel Landois Foundation was to fund research projects uh, dealing with preservation. And this uh, project came to us at some point from the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Uh, John Ippolito, uh, among other people. And what we requested uh, in order to fund the project is that they try to do an actual restoration of a work because the project came and it was rather another theoretical uh, uh, research project. So we insisted that uh, an actual work uh, be done. The actual work it was uh, composed of three laser discs uh, a program, a custom, made, a custom written program uh, in Pascal. Uh, it was uh, working on a computer, SMC70 computer, uh, that were around quite a bit in the early uh, 80s. And here you have the diagram uh, on the top, the old system and the new system. And here I'm going to read because I don't want to get lost in my explanation of this. So the Arkane project um, by uh, actually the work the Arkane is by Graham Weinbrenn and Roberta Friedman. It, it dates 82-85. Uh, Three laser discs, Pascal program with CPM operating system, wood and metal construction, two monitors, two touch screen, um, approximately 8 by 10 by 12 feet. The piece by Weinbrenn and Friedman was an early example of interactive video installation comprising 16, 16 millimeter footage transferred to analog uh, laser discs and a custom program written in Pascal that allowed the viewers uh, through a touch screen to select passages from the footage and navigate through the film. This project uh, was funded, as I said, by the Landlois Foundation, and we insisted on uh, this uh, sort of um, attempt at uh, rejuvenating uh, the system so that the work could be shown uh, on modern or modern in those days, 2003-04, computers. The original vision of the Earl King update uh, was to use object code level emulation to run the original SMC70 operating system and the Earl King programs. But for reasons that are explained in the final report, and the final report that can be found at this uh, URL there, um, this approach had to be modified, and finally, a compromise was suggested to emulate the external hard our hardware devices but interpret the original Earl King uh, software at the Pascal code level instead of emulating the object code. Those who would uh, like to go in details uh, have to go <laughs> and read the whole report. But I just want here to uh, raise a few questions that the report itself do raise. Where do we draw the line at modification of the original system's behavior? If the original system has errors that would sometimes cause it to crash or otherwise clearly, clearly cause errors, this would probably not be considered an, an essential part of the original system experience that must be emulated. 
Uh, although, you know, we've seen today somebody uh, showed some um, artist work where actual errors or crash or things like that may be uh, what the artists want. Uh, so the value of improvements to the original may be debatable. For example, the initial working version of the updated, updated Earl King had a substantially faster response time than the original uh, to play the video. The artist decided that uh, this, in fact, degraded the viewer's experience. So we had to slow down the video player uh, to match the original speed. So in the or original system in 82, there was a lag of um, at least a few seconds be, uh, before the disk uh, reached the segment that was called by the viewer. So the artist wanted that lag. So we had to slow down the, uh, the new system. The programmer had to decide what language to use for the project. He ended up choosing Java for the Pascal interpreter. His reason uh, were, among other things, that uh, Java is a very popular language and so is likely to remain supported for the foreseeable future, which obviously is an important consideration when you do preservation. It is freely available for most computer systems and it avoids a large group of memory bugs and leaks possible in C, C++. For the video, it was decided for reasons, again, that you'll find in details in the report, uh, that each frame of the films would be digitized as uncompressed bitmap images and played back at 24 frames per second. This solution did not rely on any particular video coding scheme, which was its attractive feature. To conclude about this experiment, uh, which is uh, already 14 years old, uh, I will quote the report or uh, paraphrase, it, paraphrase it. For video and film projects, projects in particular, I think the use of Java for display and uncompressed single frame images for archiving and preservation offers an interesting combination of high quality and low cost. It is also, uh, uh, the, the uh, programmer also thought that some uh, more general lessons can be drawn from this project about the use of emulation in this type of preservation effort. In, in uh, short, um, there's no uh, silver bullet. That is, in computer science, it's always tempting to overstate the benefits of a single technique emulation object-oriented programming, networked uh, systems, etc. In practice, though, usu you usually find that the technique has some benefit, but that most of the devil is in the details of a particular project you're working on. In particular, all those works relying on the external hardware that may be hard to emulate and might impose a lot of compromises. Obviously, if you have uh, projects that deal with, uh, I don't know, virtual reality with uh, gog goggles and all sorts of uh, peripherals that would uh, be even more uh, complication in order to preserve such works. Now, I want to say a few words about the DOCAM research project. DOCAM stands for Documentation and Preservation, and uh, Documentation and Conservation of the Media Arts Heritage. It was a project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and headed by the Daniel Landro Foundation. It was a project uh, that ran from 2005 to 2010. And uh, the um, goal of the project was to look at how to preserve technologically based artworks. It involved uh, museums such as uh, the National Gallery of Canada, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal, Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal, the Centre Canadien d'Architecture, and many universities. You can go to the website. Uh, you'll find a lot of uh, material there. We looked into how we catalog uh, those uh, artworks when a museum, say, uh, acquire a work. 
So cataloging here, and that's something we haven't touched too much today, but uh, the question of metadata. Uh, when you catalog uh, works, or if uh, Vincent Morissette comes with his box one day to the Cinematheque, we'll open his box and we'll, we'll start to catalog what's, it, what's in it. And cataloging maybe at many levels. Obviously, we'll do a description, uh, intellectual description, the title, the artist's name, uh, year, and so on. But then we'll try to extract a lot of technical metadata about uh, the softwares, the hardwares, dependencies, and all of those things. So in the DOCAM project, we worked a lot on, uh, on uh, cataloging uh, those works mainly in the context of art museum. We did a conservation um, guide how to treat these uh, works when once they enter a collection. We did a technological timeline uh, because we were looking not only at uh, digital work, we were looking at uh, slide installation from the 60s. You know, nowadays, if you want to project slides, you may have difficulty finding a slide projector. So uh, it went from those um, uh, uh, 60s technologies up to digital uh, artwork. So we did a technological timeline in order to help curators to be able to decipher uh, in what technological um, uh, reality they, they, they are when facing a particular work. And we developed a documentation mo model. And we um, started from the principle that documentation is, is key. And uh, just a moment ago, somebody said that for researchers, it's very important to know how it was made, by what software, and so on. So there exist tools to document the process. Uh, another one I don't have, I forgot to put the, the link there, but uh, you may, or maybe I did, uh, yeah, Recall. Uh, Recall is an open source uh, web uh, accessible thing that uh, was developed by Clarisse Bardio in France, mainly for what, what they call uh, les arts vivants in, in France, uh, dance, theater. And, uh, but basically, this can be used also by uh, producers, creators, to document the process. So you can gather all sorts of documents, and they get uh, ordered uh, in certain ways. Uh, you could go and look at it. I have very little time left. Just a few words about the Cinematheque Québécoise and digital preservation. We are responsible for the uh, legal deposit of film in Quebec. Uh, and television since 2006. And uh, since 2011, we just get digital production uh, and DCPs for film uh, and uh, fi uh, digital files for TV programs. And this, um, uh, I have to, if I want to keep my time, <laughs> I have to uh, conclude very quickly that it's been a very difficult uh, leap forward in terms of um, expertise that we have to develop, but also in terms of a technological system we have to put in place. Because in order to preserve digital uh, works, films, um, and sometimes we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of uh, DPX files, so terabytes of uh, data for one film, uh, in order to manage all these uh, files and migrate them and check them in order to know if they are still, uh, you know, error-free, uh, this means uh, putting in place a very large and costly system uh, on top of the expertise that we need to uh, gather either by external sources or by uh, having the, the right people internally. And uh, I referred to our um, uh, meager budgets. <laughs> um, and despite the fact that we have a large mandate, uh, the funding at this point 
is not really there. One last point, because we're going to go into a panel about policies. Here in Quebec and uh, Canada, we do uh, put a lot of money into productions, distributions. We want our films to be in all these big festivals all over the place. And so there's a lot of money going towards production, distribution, but there's nothing for preservation. So these works eventually will arrive at the Cinematic Québécois, but for the last mm, 10, 15, so, uh, close to 20 years, our bu budgets have been like pretty much the same. So <coughs> we have to take care of all these new productions, now digitally uh, produced, but basically with the same resources. And it becomes really uh, difficult. And one would hope that there we could imagine a scheme where some uh, money on the production budgets could be reserved for the preservation aspects of the work. Uh, this is something we would <coughs> eventually have to work out with producers probably, so that they have in mind also the aspect of, uh, of uh, preservation, so that they apply a certain number of standards uh, right at the production stage and post-production stage. And, um, but this has to be uh, thought of and uh, implemented in terms of policy. Thank you. <laughs>